On the right hand side, I have my brushes in a thin paint uh, tray that's used for rolling out stuff. And next to that, I keep a, a rag and a little cup of paint thinner. Both um, the rag and the paint thinner are in little vegetable containers to keep them from spilling. Then above that, you see some pins and some razor blades. And on the left hand side is my palette. So I want to talk about my palette first of all, so that you know what colors I'm using and what kind of paint. You may want to pause it at this point and write down the palette if you're learning how to paint. So uh, in the same order that it's on the palette, I've got cadmium orange, cadmium red light, some sort of deeper red like a rose or a scarlet, a burnt sienna, a burnt, sometimes I use a raw umber, whatever's on sale, <laughs> uh, lamp black, and Payne's gray. And you'll notice at the top, I have two piles of white paint. On the left-hand side is an alkyd-based paint that dries very quickly. And to the right of that pile is, um, I think it's Dick Blick Soft Mixing White or Windsor & Newton Soft Mixing White, which is a student-grade paint. And then the two piles next to it are mixtures of some of the other colors that I pre-mix for flesh tones. So, for example, the lighter um, orange pile, the pale orange, is actually uh, cadmium orange mixed with some of the alkyd white and a touch of um, either raw umber or black in that to, to dull it slightly. And then the other pile is a little bit of that mixture that I just said, and then I mix in um, a bit more cadmium orange and also some burnt sienna and mix that up. And then I've kind of got a little bit of a mid-range of colors so that I can just grab to build up the paint texture or paint surface a little bit. I sped up this next sequence, and I'm going to show you how I use just a simple version of grid and transfer to start getting the image down on the canvas really fast. Basically, I have pre-made grids uh, in Photoshop and I paint off of my computer, so I just have a simple half and half and half kind of grid that I can just throw in there very quickly. It just allows me a quick guideline. In this next section, what I'm doing is I'm taking um, raw umber or burnt umber and just sketching in everything using the the grids that I have. But um, <clears throat> one of the things that I suppose is very important is that I actually really understand the anatomy of the face. So the grid is not a replacement for learning how to draw the big structures and understanding the anatomy. This next section here, I'm actually just sort of blocking in the big shadow masses using uh, a little bit of watered down, or actually thinned down, not watered down, um, burnt umber. And what I'll do is once I get the drawing established, I'll start using those piles. And you can see that I started with the darker mixture, <clears throat> and I'm using that to just mass in or block in most of the dark, big, abstract shadow areas. In that area, I started adding a little bit of black and a little bit of Payne's gray. thought that it might be kind of a nice um, purpley lifting up into the later colors that I put on top. You can see I'm starting to add the lighter tones. And don't worry, I know it looks really, really yellow, but it's going to turn more flesh toned because of all the dirtying up of the colors that happen. I bet uh, <laughs> you noticed that I 
painted on an old panel to do this. I like the texture of, of paintings that are unsuccessful. Um, they're kind of fun to paint on top of. I actually kind of think of it a little bit like paint by numbers with blending. Like I've got these pre-mixed colors that I use. And when I paint from a photo, I actually turn it into black and white so that I don't have to deal with um, how the computer screen sees color. Because a lot of the time, the computer screen is lacking in some of the pinks and reds that I think make a really good painting. I love it when the uh, the grays start mixing in. All right, now I'm going for the higher areas. Now, there's a sort of rule in terms of flesh color that the forehead seems to be a little bit paler and yellower. Um, I also add a thicker grade of paint when I start to thicken things up a little bit. And so the first thing that I'm really thinking about is getting the value structure right. So the forehead would be more of a yellow and the cheeks would be more of a pink. And in the beard area, it's either gray, blue, or green. It cools off. Uh, the knuckles and uh, cheeks... Um, and the tip of the nose will be a little bit pinker when I finally work out the color. But that's all like it's not color that I see in the image on the screen. It's actually color that I have sort of formulated, and I guess you would say it's a little stylized. So that's a cadmium red light mixed in with some of those grays and browns and stuff like that. And uh, the lower lid of most people is a little pinker. The ears are going to be pinker, too. I just keep pushing back and forth and adding lights, uh, then sort of smearing them in, doing subtle shading. And I use the largest brushes I can for as long as I can possibly stand to when I'm painting. Uh, if you look at this, this is a number six brush that um, is a bristle and holds the paint really well. And it's actually pretty soft, especially on a canvas panel. But this, uh, I guess it's, it's a 16? Yeah, I think it's a 16. Um, is probably about, I don't know, half an inch, quarter of an inch. Um, but I started with the, with the big inch and a half brush. And then I'll go down to a size 12 brush later on to do things. I found the background distracting. So what I decided to do is just make a sort of purpley gray for the background. Um, and whenever I use a color one spot, I try to pull it in all the other different places in the painting, just so that the colors sort of pollute each other. Now, a little thing about uh, cleaning brushes. I don't ever actually clean them, clean them. I have like that little paint tray, the bottom of the screen on the right-hand side. And um, I put walnut oil in that and I just let them lay in there overnight. I have it inside a Tupperware container so that the fumes don't continue to permeate the room, but I do have the windows in my studio open all the time. And when I change colors, I dip it in that thinner and then wipe it off on a rag. And then I actually have another dry rag that you can't see here that's hanging from my easel. And I use that to sort of get the rest. Now, the rest of the painting is more or less just push and pull. I keep going back in with uh, variations of 
grays, um, burnt umber or raw umber mixed in with some of the colors to dull them. Then I keep going into the nose and the face and pinking things up and adding highlights. Um, at one point, I, uh, I walked away from the painting and went out for lunch. And uh, in that amount of time, the paint was able to tack up a little bit. Um, that's probably about an hour that I gave it to sort of rest. And I was able to come back in. And that's what you see me now is starting to add in some of the lighter tones and to uh, do more subtle value shifts. But I'm also doing the best I can to build up as much paint on the panel as possible. And fighting against the texture that's underneath it actually makes me use more paint. And uh, I kind of have this idea that when you're making a painting, my job more or less is to get as much paint onto the panel as possible because I like for the surface to feel kind of like a little bit like its skin. So I keep pushing and pushing and pushing as much paint as I can on. So walking away from it for a couple of hours and then coming back usually allows the alkyd to do its job. And alkyd can dry sometimes uh, super, super fast. Now, with this area here, I'm going back with that original second dark mixture, but I've added a little bit more burnt umber into it, and I'm still trying to restate the values and get them right, and also little things like reflected light. I remember I had a bit of trouble with the eyes um, on this because I wanted them to be looking at the viewer more instead of looking off and uh, the white of the eye stuff is always very confusing for me because you can't use white white you have to actually use a sort of grayish white so a lot of times what I'll do for the whites of the eyes is use a either a gray lamp black and white or I will use um, burnt umber uh, and, uh, and a bit of white you can see <laughs> if it's too bright, it looks creepy. So one of the things I count on doing is muddying it up, and then you got to paint the lid over that um, so that it cuts a nice sort of edge on it. I've switched to a number eight um, bristle. It's a flat. So I was using as, as long as I possibly could stand to the biggest brushes. Now I'm allowing myself to uh, treat myself to something that makes it a little easier. And the reason why I do that is if you use small brushes at the beginning, you'll, you won't have big value statements um, and you won't really have it block up, um, you know, look like, big swirls of juicy paint, I guess, is kind of what I want. And so if I use a, a smaller brush, it actually hinders me in getting paint on there. Now, the whole video is extremely sped up. Um, it was about six hours to make the painting. And I thought that I've sat through really long painting demos <laughs> and watched every stroke and I didn't think it was necessary. So what I wanted to do is speed up the process, make it a speed painting here, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the color. Now, remember that the lips, nose, and uh, across the cheeks is pinked out. And uh, I at one point had to go in for the either scarlet or rose pink to actually push it a little bit further. And I have now also switched into a softer number eight Dick Blick master stroke brush. Now the next part is the eyes and we're gonna sort of focus in a little bit on the eyes and the nose. And one of the things that's important is that women know this from putting on makeup that the, if you, 
there's actually a, like a little lip or uh, a ridge just before your eyelashes. So it's important to get the highlight in there to do that. And that highlight is a sort of pink because it's a very soft, fleshy kind of color. There's also uh, the tear duct in the corner that needs a little highlight. And what I generally tend to do is just a quick swoop to reflect the um, reflected light off of the back of the eye. And then I'll add a as high uh, a white, um, it's usually the whitest highlight besides the highlight on the ridge of the nose in the whole painting. And the rest of the painting, what, what I'll do is I'm going to go step back and forth and modulate things. And in the next section, which you'll see, I'm going to um, speed it up again. You'll see that I actually even add some blues and grays into the beard area. And I'm not afraid to use black, which is kind of an important thing. I've sped up the rest of the video super, super fast. Uh, it's probably going at a thousand times the rate <laughs> that it was painted. So this last four or five minutes of the video probably represents about two hours of painting. And what I want you to notice is that I keep going back and refixing things and replacing things. I'll wipe out a nostril, I'll put it back, then I'll take it out again, then I'll put it back. I'll keep adding uh, pinks uh, into areas of the face and then pull them out again. Uh, it's almost like um, trying to get up in the morning and find an outfit. <laughs> and as I'm working, what I keep doing is trying to restate the biggest values and try to have reasonable value scale jumps. Now, uh, the color just shifted in the video because the, the light in the room <laughs> shifted a little bit. Um, which I thought was kind of interesting, but it'll pop back and forth uh, because, you know, this is painted all day and the light of my studio changed radically over the day, even though I have a consistent fluorescent light on top. Now, using black to dull colors is okay, and it just sort of reminds me of a story that Claude Monet and uh, John Singer Sargent were painting. And um, Sargent leaned over and asked Monet if he had any black, and Monet started yelling at him, yammering something about, you mix it yourself, you, you know, because Monet was an impressionist, and he thought that using pure black was not cool. Um, but I actually think that, you know, I've read things by Leonardo um, where he believes that you should add uh, lamp black or uh, not ivory black, but lamp black to the to flesh tones. Um, it also black can act sort of as a blue um, in a very warm painting. So when you add black to white, you get this sort of almost blue gray. Uh, especially with lamp black because it's the carbon is not a, a warm black. It's actually a cool black that leans a bit towards uh, the blues. And doing the last finishing touches, I can keep going back and forth. Uh, at this point, I've probably been working about yeah six hours or so. Um, and I know that if I keep working after this, uh, I'm going to mess it up. And so I forced myself to finish uh, at around five o'clock in the evening. <laughs> Thanks for watching.